from Mario to Master Chief. That game is awesome. 8 bit to high def. The battle is on. It's one team trying to beat the other team. Heroes versus assassins. Finish him! Finish him! Finish him! Legends versus monsters. She's the toughest bad guy in the game. I gotta thank these little digital guys with the big hearts. Does it feel good to be a champion? Yeah. Boom shakalaka. We're counting down the top 100 video games of all time. Cool. Mario Brothers is basically like a, a quest on acid. Just last night, I was lost in the jungle with Pitfall Harry. I love shooters. Best game of all time is Mario Party. Skyrim is a way of life. Best game of all time. That's the game we used to play a lot. Portal is the best game on the planet. I got really hooked on that game. There's only one place to start, and that's at the very beginning of gaming. Number 100 on our countdown is Pong. I played Pong. I'm old. I can play Pong. Really groundbreaking moment for gaming. Pong is so simple, yet it was so immediately addictive to so many people. It's amazing how much time you can, you can spend playing a game that's like three pixels smashing into each other. Pong was OG, black and white, beautiful. Atari's Pong bounced into arcades in 1972 and initiated a seismic shift in entertainment through its sheer popularity. Pong was one of those first video games that got people into the idea of how you could move something on the screen. For our ancestors in the ancient 20th century, it set the tone for an entire generation of video game. Pong blew people's minds. Pong. Man, the graphics whew, still blow me away today. Just black background, white bar, white little ball. Just going back and forth. You remember the. In 1974, Atari brought Pong from the arcade into people's homes. Pong was the game that started all console games. It was really the first game that people were playing in their homes. Like, really, like, oh my god, video games can be in a home. You thought it was going to be just a one-time thing. Like, we didn't know it was going to end up leading to all these other games. We just thought it was like, oh, this is cool. Graphically simple, but simply addictive, Pong was the arcade classic that fueled many gamers' passion birthed an entire industry and started a revolution. Everybody in the world knows what Pong is, and everybody in the world will still play Pong if they get the chance to play Pong. And that's what makes this game so great. Up next is the game that taught us that za is in fact a real word. At number 99, Words with Friends. Za is the abbreviation for pizza if it's 1980 and you're in the Breakfast Club. Released in the summer of 2009 for mobile devices, Words With Friends has now been downloaded over 10 million times. I'm playing Words With Friends. Words With Friends is the best idea of taking something everyone plays, like Scrabble, and then just making it digital. Words With Friends is an epic, bloody battle of Scrabble. No, it's not <laughs> just that. The sad truth for me about Words With Friends is I can't add anybody because I have so many active games already going. It's pathetic. Oh, Words With Friends. Curse you, Words With Friends. Yes, I am guilty of Words With Friends. Ooh, you stole my wife. Words With Friends is so addictive, Alec Baldwin got kicked off a plane for not shutting off his phone. I only challenge people that I know I'm smarter than. I tend to let people, you know, think that I'm not very good, so they beat me a couple of times, and then I come back and hit them with the whammy. The best is when you are, you have nothing, your hands are empty, it's about to be over for you, and you just push a bunch of crap together and magically make a sandwich. That is my favorite kind of play in Words With Friends. Words With Friends is a cultural phenomenon and one of the best games of all time. In fact, you're probably playing Words With Friends right now. I just hit you with jukebox. How about that? You hear that music playing? Yeah, that's me whooping your ass. Next on our countdown, 
If you play the Atari 2600, you recognize this sound. Oh my God, Pitfall. Pitfall was awesome. Yep, swinging into the number 98 spot, Pitfall. Strange fun fact, my first paid gig for acting was a, uh, a commercial for a Pitfall. I had a safari hat on, I was like, just last night I was lost in the jungle with Pitfall Harry. Pitfall hit the Atari 2600 in 1982 and was an instant smash. Love Pitfall. <laughs> Pitfall is incredible. I remember as a kid just being like, oh my god, this is what this is all about. It's right when home video games started creating people out of like four squares. I'm a stick guy and you can see that I have a green shirt and brown pants and shoes. These 8-bit blogs had us all duped in the 80s to thinking that we were Indiana Jones. The Indiana Jones-esque Pitfall Harry had to negotiate caverns, chasms, scorpions, snakes, and those damn alligators. It took me months to realize, oh, I can jump on the crocodile's heads. It was the adventure. It was amazing. Loved grabbing the rope and swinging over and be like, na 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 it is the same screen a hundred times. <laughs> and yet, all they had to do <laughs> to make it different for us was put an alligator or a vine or a bar of gold. We were easily entertained in the 80s. I would play that game for hours. To the Next, the game that's hailed as the best basketball game ever and the finest sports game of its generation. At number 97, NBA 2K11. To the bucket. NBA 2K11 is my game. NBA 2K11, a uh, classic. This is one of the most realistic basketball games. The NBA 2K series is probably my favorite video game series of all time. NBA 2K11 is like the, the coolest game, the coolest basketball game ever. Over Allen. Yes! 2K11 gave basketball fans and sport game lovers alike the action, interactivity, and attention to detail that they crave. They, they graphics and they made, just make the game real. The design and the game flow, the graphics, the movements into dunks, the crossover dribbles, it's all so seamless. You know, that's when everybody had their custom shots. You got Rondo with the fake behind the back passes. I mean, you got Dirk and Whiskey, you got Fade Away. You know, Kevin Durant got the dribble, dribble, shimmy shake pulling up. NBA 2K is so realistic. Like, I couldn't keep Yao on the court for more than two games in a row. Jordan may have been on the cover. Air Jordan! But 2K11 fans knew who to play as if you wanted to dominate the game. Cheating with LeBron. It ain't really cheating because he on the game, so he on the game like everybody else, so I like playing with Miami Heat. You call it having LeBron James on your team cheating? Like, that's crazy. I mean, he's a real, you know, that's what he do in real life. But I don't think nobody topped LeBron on that game. You know, they said 99, but he played like 199. Like, there was nothing he couldn't do. He catch fire, he hit everything. You can't worry about what LeBron is doing or worry about they blowing out. You play your game. That's what wins. Regardless who you choose to play as, NBA 2K11 provides fans with unforgettable basketball action. I beat Justin Bieber on that game. Uh, I beat Sean Kingston on that game. All of my friends, I beat them. NBA 2K11 is a classic. Money! Coming up next. I don't know how the hell they will warp back to the top. We warp back in time to blast away at the arcade. Everyone loved Galaga. And take the controls of a game that made you actually root for the Empire. I don't think anybody expected that, and that's what made the game awesome. Plus, the blockbuster that taught you how to shred like a rock god. Now you're unbelievable at that. You're better than Slash at his own song. But first, what artist has the most songs in Guitar Hero 1 and 2? The answer, after the break. Before the break, we asked what artist has the most songs in Guitar Hero 1 and 2. The answer, Ozzy Osbourne. One as a solo artist, two with Black Sabbath. And now a video game that pulled off the impossible by making air guitar even more awesome. 
Jamming in at number 96, it's the hard rocking encore, Guitar Hero 2. Uh, well, 2 was the one that I played that got me turned on to Guitar Hero in the first place. And I'd be playing for like hours and hours on end. I'd be up at like 5 in the morning, like, just one more game, just one more attempt at Freebird on difficult level. Released in 2006, Guitar Hero 2 improved on the original, making virtual guitarists feel more than ever like real-life rock stars. The wide appeal of Guitar Hero is that not all of us can play guitar. Like, that is hard. But you got four or five buttons? All right, I can handle this. I feel like a G now. I'm rocking out. But you've probably seen all your friends in this position, in this position. Blue, green, red. I like to play guitar here in my underwear. Basically, it's the best way to go. Like, it's really hot when you're, you know, on the axe. I'm all about the music, so I would like to get every note right and make sure I use the whammy at applicable times. Well, that makes everybody feel like they have rhythm, and I and I love that because I'm one of the few black people without it. So, you know, it helps me get back to my roots. So I never dreamed of being a professional maracaist but uh, uh, Rock God with a guitar, and like the second you turn it like this, like you just knew that it was gonna be a huge, huge, huge thing. A smash hit that managed to outsell its successful predecessor, Guitar Hero 2 exposed a new generation of fans to the lost art of hard rock. It's kind of introduced our music to a whole nother, probably a much younger generation. Uh, actually, a generation that forgot there was even guitar solos. And what's really interesting about Guitar Hero is the way it breaks the music down and sort of forces people to appreciate why it's so cool. As far as I'm concerned, that game's about like the coolest thing to happen to guitar since Father Van Halen played Eruption. You never know, out of that game, you're gonna get your next Hendrix. I pretend to be Jimi Hendrix, just out there like this with my bandana, getting it. Well, now you're unbelievable at that. You're better than Slash at his own song. I can shred, just on the Guitar Hero, not real life. Not, not real life. I think it's great. You know what, man? The guitar is the coolest instrument in the world. Our next game is as patently ridiculous as it is endlessly fun to play. At number 95, it's the video game that made fast food fun. What time is it? It's burger time. Burger time. Burger time. Burger time landed in arcades in 1982 and was an instant hit. Burger time is a game where you're a chef and you're running around making a giant burger for some sort of giant person, I imagine. Like the bun would come down first, and then the lettuce would come down, and then the meat would come down, and then the cheese would come down. You have to get the ingredients to fall down in the correct order while there are evil things chasing you. Mr. Pickle, Mr. Hot Dog, and Mr. Egg are always on Chef Peter's buns. And his only means of defense, a light sprinkling of pepper. There's something really interesting and bizarre about walking across the top of a bun, like a giant bun, and then forming a giant hamburger and being chased by like those hot dogs with legs and you would throw pepper on them and inevitably run out of pepper. I think a whole generation of people actually went into the food service industry because of games like Burger Time. When I was a kid, I was like, oh yeah, that's how they make burgers. I'd never seen anybody make a burger. I was like, okay, so they have a little person who runs around and makes me this burger. Pretty good. Was that game for McDonald's employees? <laughs> Basically, just to get you to figure out how to make a burger. It was an early, early training program. I think so. Burger time, I, I would play it, but then I just hated it because it just made me hungry all the time. It was a good game. And now for a game that allowed players to reverse time itself, resulting in a truly trippy experience. You'd be like, oh! <laughs> At number 94, the time-shifting, mind-melting adventure that is Braid. It's a mental exercise like no other. I mean, it really pushes the boundaries of what they did on Xbox Live. A combination platformer and puzzle game, Braid jumped onto the Xbox Live in 2008 and though it may seem straightforward at first... If you screwed up, if you died, you could go back in time and just do it again. And you learn from your mistakes, and they just let you do it kind of over and over, backwards, until you finally got to the end result. Oh, oh, oh. 
I sucked your ass out, bitch. I actually did like a YouTube video and it got like crazy millions of views and all my fans in the gamer boards, they were all talking about, did you see the Soldier Boy Brave video? It was hilarious to me just rewinding time and, and jumping off of cliffs and, and rewinding myself back up the cliff. And the further I made it into the game, the more I liked about each innovation of it. Braid's time-bending mechanic opened people's minds to downloadable games and helped make it the highest-rated Xbox Live game of all time. You have to think so hard of how you're going to play the game because you don't know how time is going to move. But once you've figured all that out, you realize that you've been sitting there playing the game for three days. So time in real life has also gotten out of control. You can rewind time, you can fast forward time, like you can do all these different things. But at the end of the day, you're chasing after a princess. And you get to the princess, she runs away, and then you find out the reason she runs away is because you're the creepy ass dude that she was running from. And what guy can't relate to that, right? And imagine if you're a female gamer, you look at this game and you go, that is, uh, that's what college was like for me. Braid did more than just tease our brains. It twisted time perception and expectations resulting in a heady trip for gamers. I think it's one of the best video games because it's the most innovative. That's what I think. Our next game takes you to a galaxy far, far away. Destroy everything. Take no prisoners. At number 93 on our countdown, embrace the dark side and step inside the cockpit of Star Wars TIE Fighter. Until LucasArts' 1994 PC masterpiece TIE Fighter, no Star Wars game ever allowed you to assume the role of the villainous Galactic Empire. The Empire is on the verge of success. Star Wars TIE Fighter is cool because you didn't have to play as the good guy. You can play as the bad guy, and I don't think anybody expected that, and that's what made the game awesome. I love TIE Fighter because TIE Fighter told the whole story from the Empire's point of view, and you felt really noble joining the Empire and bringing peace and order to the galaxy. It actually made you feel proud to fly a ship for the Empire. You actually have that twisted point of view, which is really fun. When you're watching the movie, you never really get into the mind of a TIE Fighter pilot. In the game, though, that's a whole other part of the Star Wars world that you're privy to, so that, that was really groundbreaking. Star Wars TIE Fighter isn't just an innovative story. It's one of the best space flight simulators ever developed. And when you were flying the TIE Fighters, they felt like the TIE Fighters in the movie. They were like, you know, really light and kind of almost nervous flying them around, weak but agile. And so like one hit, they'd blow up. But yet they were really hard to hit, you know? So yeah, I think he did a really good job of taking kind of the feeling of the TIE Fighters from the movie and translating it into basically kind of a space flight simulator. Thanks to Star Wars TIE Fighter, being bad was never so much fun. I bet a lot of kids played this game and probably had like a newfound respect and maybe a little bit uh, more of an understanding as to why the Empire wanted to blow up entire planets. Coming up next, the survival horror classics that taught you not to startle the witch. What the f Gary? And then everybody's dead, because Gary made a sound. And to stay away from Silent Hill. I just couldn't stop playing that game and it just, I'm all up from it. Plus the PC blockbuster that let you play house. Or you could just lock everybody in the house and delete the doors and set it on fire. <laughs> we used to do that too. But first, what musical group members are featured as characters in The Sims? The answer when the top 100 video games of all time returns. What musical group is featured as characters in The Sims? The answer? Fergie, Will I Am, and the Black Eyed Peas. And now an arcade classic with all the right moves. At number 92, it's the finger tapping classic, Galaga. First of all, f bees. I am not a fan of bees, so this made me really happy to shoot space bees out of the sky. <laughs> Galaga was unleashed at arcades in 1981. The gameplay was familiar to fans of Space Invaders, but unlike its predecessor, the baddies in Galaga were bee-like creatures that zipped and swarmed at you with dizzying precision. Galaga's like the next level of Space Invaders. It's still Space Invaders, but they're a lot more aggressive. You know what I mean? They're coming down to you. They're fly. 
come down and get your ass. Then they go past you and they come back up. I don't know how the hell they will warp back to the top. They go past you and end up back at the top again. What the hell is that? Galaga was the first cause of carpal tunnel syndrome because you got the joystick in one hand, the other hand, you got to hit it for every bullet. You got a permanent hook. You're like an old lady in an arcade begging for quarters from strangers. I feel like Galaga was the game that kind of introduced us to the concept of the challenge stage, where you would get like five stages and you get the crazy challenge stage. That weird like manta ray, space manta ray thing, shoot down the force field and you'd be like, oh, that doesn't that capture me and it capture you. You allow yourself to take your own ship hostage and then you have to free yourself and get the double guns. Not only did Galaga introduce features that gamers had never seen before, it was a massive success. Everyone loved Galaga. Next, they're putting their lives in your hands. At number 91, it's The Sims. The Sims, man, let me tell you about The Sims. The Sims definitely feeds into my god complex. There's something about The Sims. Maybe it's the fact that, you know, you're controlling another human being, which I think secretly we all wish we could do. Oh, voila. SimCity mastermind Will Wright unveiled his people-centric follow-up The Sims in 2000, unleashing an addictive one-of-a-kind life simulation game. When I first started on The Sims, I wanted to do kind of for architecture what SimCity was doing for city planning. The people really were meant to originally be the scoring system. It ended up being a strategy game that everybody could relate to. Everybody was playing this game already in their life. Um, this was just kind of abstracting it in you know, kind of a strategic uh, level. I'm a little embarrassed that I, I love The Sims so much because it is basically playing house. I, I got a kick out of like and having the guy and the girl flirt and then get married and, and all that stuff. Like it was a big accomplishment. But you gotta have a job, you gotta make some money, you know, you can expand your house, you can add plants and TVs and couches. And, or you can just lock everybody in the house and delete the doors and set it on fire. <laughs> we used to do that too. The freedom to play house, play God, and play with life and death helped The Sims become the top-selling PC title of all time. You start becoming addicted to this game. You know, you don't work, you don't sleep, you don't eat, you know, you, you wait too long to go to the bathroom. Also, that you can play this game where you work, sleep, eat, and go to the bathroom. You know, The Sims is a dope game. <laughs> uh -huh. Next, the game that shaped the fantasy RPGs we play today. At number 90, Baldur's Gate 2, Shadows of Um. Baldur's Gate 2 was really the first video game that captured that flavor of Dungeons & Dragons. When Baldur's Gate 2 was released for the PC in September of 2000, it set the bar for fantasy role-playing games with a narrative that immersed gamers in the world of Dungeons & Dragons' Forgotten Realms. You are a smart one. Baldur's Gate 2, the story was great on that one. Yeah, really great. I'm an explorer who likes to have a story to go along with what I'm exploring. Baldur's Gate really gave me that. Yes, it is done. Baldur's Gate 2 not only dropped you into the world of the Forgotten Realms, it allowed you to explore with friends online. The dungeons, everything you do, it's very much like Dungeons and & Dragons. And really being able to go into that fantasy world only without the guy with the mouthpiece drooling into the cup, which makes it perfect. And now for a game that drags survival horror to intense new places. Shotgun in the face always drops a zombie. At number 89, Left 4 Dead. I'm a huge zombie fanatic, and Left 4 Dead got me really excited. Really fun, very satisfying game. It's seamless, it's fast-paced. Left 4 Dead made me want the zombie apocalypse to happen. When it dropped in 2008, Valve's Left 4 Dead kept gamers running for their lives thanks to an incredibly sophisticated and vicious AI. What's amazing about Left 4 Dead is that they have a director who sort of watches you, and if he thinks things are going too easy, he throws new zombies at you. So it's completely unpredictable. The spawn points of your enemies changed every time you played. 
So it would create a completely different experience for the player. And like any great survival horror game, Left 4 Dead boasted a rogues gallery of repulsive bad guys. They have like different kinds of zombies. So there's like a zombie that spits at you, a zombie that grabs you with its tongue. And then the witch don't wake the witch. She looks like RuPaul on crack. You have to sneak by her. If you make a sound, she wakes up and she's the toughest bad guy in the game. <laughs> So, Gary, Gary, don't. There's, okay, there's a witch there. Okay, you just. Ah! What the f Gary? And then everybody's dead. For me, the fun of it is playing multiplayer. So you play with your friends, you have people freaking out, you go up against that giant fat zombie. Being on that earpiece and hearing other people scream because they're freaking out, that's pretty fun. And then you scream and you hope it's on mute, but it's not. While I'm playing online, I'm also talking trash. Watch out, Lewis! And every now and then I'll get into a fight with somebody that's supposed to be on my team. And it's like, hey, hey, don't steal that gun. Fine, you steal that gun, fine. If you die, I'm not reviving you. You're done. We have an adventure together. Like, the multiplayer really makes Left 4 Dead fun. It's like going through a haunted house, you know? Um, and it, that horror element to it really adds something that you don't get from other games. So good choice there. Coming up, we hit the hardwood with an NES classic. Double dribble, best technology ever. Drop into the middle of a massive sci-fi trilogy. It's a heavy game. And take a trip down memory lane with OutRun. Don't drive your car into things at 100 miles an hour. If you have a Ferrari, you, you'll die. But first, what was the first video game to be blasted into Earth's orbit? The answer, when the top 100 video games returns. Before the break, we asked what was the first video game to be blasted into Earth's orbit? The answer? StarCraft was launched into space aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery in 1999. Next, one of the most memorable sports games for the original NES. At number 88, it's... Bubble Dibble. It was, at the time, Double Dribble, best technology ever. I mean, every kid I knew that, that played basketball wanted to have double dribble at their house. Released to arcades in 1986 and ported to the original Nintendo the following year, Konami's Double Dribble was one of the early games to use cutscenes and actual speech. Double Dribble. And it had that saying, double dribble, like when you started the game. So it was kind of like, oh my god, they're talking. <laughs> I remember every time cutting it on, double dribble. Double dribble. Double dribble. Double dribble. Double dribble. Double dribble. The guy had a speech impediment, but it was awesome. Although the game lacked the participation of the NBA, resulting in teams like the Boston Frogs, in double dribble, the hoops action was all pro. But I was good in that game because I, I knew the, the sweet spots. If you could just hit that spot, man, right there in the corner of that three-point line, and you could shoot threes all day long, you'd never miss. I mean, if you knew that and your friend didn't, you were going to dominate your friends in that game. Every three-pointer had an explosion. When you shoot the ball, it goes I think they borrowed the soundage from, like, a war game because it was like and then when it hit the goal, it went Next up, it's the Empire Strikes Back of gaming's greatest sci-fi adventure. The pinnacle of the space saga. It's a heavy game. At number 87 on our countdown, it's Mass Effect 2. Released in 2010 to universal acclaim, Mass Effect 2 is a sprawling action role-playing hybrid that drops you into the middle of an intergalactic war. In five minutes of starting that game, something so crazy and epic happens that you're just like, what the hell? You travel around space, you're basically a guy that's trying to save the universe from this uh, race of creatures called the Reapers. I thought they did a really great job of, of the story, of being able to go in and pick different missions and finding the characters and learning their backstory and that every character just wasn't an NPC, it actually had a history and you kind of knew what was going on in their lives and, and it kind of made you more attached to them and so you actually cared about them when you went on the suicide mission. I will join Shepard to save the humans. 
it's so great because not only are you doing this awesome third person shooter and the weapons are amazing and the, the biotic powers are amazing, you get to like warp people and throw them through the air, you get to tear them apart at like the molecular level, or you can just shoot them in the head with a sniper rifle. Where Mass Effect 2 really shined was in its implementation of player choice and how those decisions affected the game world at large. The cool, awesome thing about it is the whole time you're going through, you get to choose whether you want to be good or bad. You can finish the game either way, but based on your choices, it then gives you different scenarios as you're going through the game. Different characters can die, different characters get loyalty to you. But Mass Effect 2 let you choose more than just whether your friends would live or die. It let you choose which of your friends you'd get to love. The whole dating sim part of Mass Effect I thought was really funny, you know, and, and so being able to play into that and, and, and trying to woo with particular women along the way. And I'm a total, uh, you know, Valentino on Mass Effect 2. The ability to create a personalized adventure through a myriad of gut-wrenching choices helped Mass Effect 2 earn 2010's Game of the Year award and a place on the top 100. I've made some terrible, terrible choices in that game and have suffered for it. But that's what makes me like the game. And now for the driving game that taught you why seat belts are essential. And that blondes like Ferraris. At number 86, Outrun. Super fast speed, Ferrari, blonde, driving, craziness. Uh, Outrun, the game that made everyone want a Ferrari with a hot blonde in it. Outrun first let you get behind the wheel of a Ferrari when it hit arcades in 1986. They realized, like, oh, we can just put a steering wheel on there. And then you actually got to drive the car. Case had the red car, and the girl was in there with you. So it was like you were this guy with a Hawaiian shirt or something next to this beautiful girl just driving down California. And oh, you had the pedal at the actual like stand-up machine, which was awesome. That was the first game where you actually had a stick ship. OutRun also has one of the most memorable crash animations in gaming history. Don't drive your car into things at 100 miles an hour. If you have a Ferrari, you, you'll die. You don't just get an extra life. It's just, you just get the one in, in life. And now for a game that was responsible for plenty of vivid nightmares. At number 85, it's the survival horror masterpiece, Silent Hill 2. It was so scary. It was a terrifying, terrifying game. Silent Hill 2 was one of those games that I loved because it just gave you the creeps. I've never been so scared in my whole life. Silent Hill, pretty neat. I think it's pretty neat. And I thought it'd be a good idea to play this game at night alone. I didn't sleep for a week. <laughs> my, my sons, I mean, they'll come, I'll see them next day and they're like, man, I couldn't sleep, dude. Yeah, I was up all night. I just couldn't stop playing that game. And it just, I'm all up from it. Released in 2001, Silent Hill 2 forces players to maneuver through heavy fog while keeping a watchful eye out for creatures just waiting to leap from the darkness. I love the atmosphere of the game. It had this really moody, kind of misty vibe about it. The fog would roll in and it looked like actual real fog. Akira Yamaoka's soundtrack would kick in and it's like, goosh, goosh, goosh. You're like, oh my god, I'm just gonna get murdered. The, just the sound design is horrifying. Wind becomes your enemy. All you hear is like that the whole time, and then a creature just comes out of the mist and attacks you. Creepy visuals, a haunting score, and dreadful silence, Silent Hill 2 is an immersive study in psychological horror. I'll kill him, just like that. I didn't play that game with the lights off. Coming up next, the games that turn Mila Jovovich into a zombie killer. Big sister is like the girl from Resident Evil. Grandma into a gamer. I mean, it revolutionized kind of what family gaming is. And thousands of kids into ninjas. What 10-year-old doesn't want to play a game when you've got throwing stars? But first, who was the first video game character with a wax replica at Madame Tussauds? The answer when we return. Before the break, we asked, who was the first video game character with a wax replica at Madame Tussauds? The answer, 
Halo's Spartan hero, Master Chief. Next on the countdown, the game that made bowling safe for grandma, if not always for your TV. At number 84, Wii Sports. It was great. I mean, it revolutionized kind of what family gaming is. My grandma played Wii Sports, which was amazing. A lot of laughs, a lot of fun. Bundled with the Nintendo Wii upon the console's release in 2006, Wii Sports exploded on the gaming scene. Home run. It was great. Like, change the way we play video games. All of a sudden, you're standing up, moving around. Amazing. Wii Sports not only revolutionized gaming, it helped Nintendo sell almost 100 million Wiis. It's like the world's greatest tech demo for the Wii. They found a way to expose people to, at the time, this incredibly new technology, but they wrapped that tutorial in a game that is so much fun to play with your friends that it became one of the top 100 games of all time. And now, the best ninja game ever created. At number 83 on our countdown, Ninja Gaiden. It's just the best ninja game ever. I learned how to run along the walls and do a bunch of backflips. What 10-year-old doesn't want to play a game when you've got throwing stars? I'd be pronouncing it wrong. I thought it was Ninja Gaiden, but Ninja Gaiden, it's like one of my favorite video games. No matter how you pronounce it, the 2004 Xbox Classic is one of the most difficult games you will ever play. Can't use this, but that game. Ninja Gaiden is one of the hardest games I've ever played. I tried normal, and normal kicked my ass. Like, just and not even, like, politely, just straight up. Just no apologies. They get you up to speed, they show you how to walk around, and then they throw you in with the boss immediately. I'm talking like I'm 10, 12 times trying to fight this boss. And when you finally figure it out, you're just about to finish, what do they go? You can't kill me, I'm your trainer. And you're like, come on. Hard as <laughs> That's pretty much sums it up. <laughs> we played a game this season at Baylor called Super Smash Bros. So shout out to my guys at Baylor. At number 82, it's the frenetic four-person fighting sensation, Super Smash Brothers Melee. It was this epic battle of everyone that you love. The follow-up to the original Super Smash Brothers, Melee hit the GameCube in 2001 and featured Nintendo's Titans battling it out in one arena. Why I was so amped when they made Super Smash Brothers, because they put all of these characters in the same game. It's like you just get to pick whoever you want to fight against each other. So it's like all the all the main characters, Yoshi, Mario, Samus, all the different characters from all the big games back then. I was always Donkey Kong because he could always beat the out of Mario. Can I say f <laughs> Super Smash Brothers Melee punched, kicked, and shot all the way to the top and became the GameCube's best-selling game of all time. It fulfilled my urge to beat the living bejesus out of Mario. I, oh god, so satisfying. Just total knee slap. Next on our countdown, the survival horror original. At number 81, Resident Evil. This way. Resident Evil changed video games for me. That was probably one of the first games where I was like, like you would jump when you played it. Like it was scary, you know? Resident Evil hit the PlayStation in 1996, launching one of the most enduring series in gaming history. Resident Evil is set in this huge mansion designed by the world's worst architect because the door is locked, but to unlock it, you have to play the Moonlight Sonata on the piano. Listen, living there must be like, can we just use regular keys for these? I'm always scared that something's gonna be around the door. You know, every door, there's about 30 zombies ready to chase you, jump through windows. It was definitely a series which brought horror uh, to the forefront of games. They did a really good job, I think, of, of demonstrating how horror could work. 25 minutes into the game is one of the biggest scares of any game in history. 
when you're inside that house and you're walking down the hallway. Dogs, dogs, crazy psycho zombie dogs. I'm not kidding you. To this day, I have never been so scared of anything in my life. Anybody who says they didn't jump at that is a liar. Resident Evil and its wild assortment of zombie dogs, deadly birds, and massively mutated bad guys earned the game a loyal following and a big screen adaptation. How I knew about it was because of my little brother, who's a huge Resident Evil fan, so we would play it together all the time. And then when I heard they were making the movie, I was like, well, you know, my little brother, I like win major points. You know, my big sister is like the girl from Resident Evil. Resident Evil has made millions of dollars in movies and sequels, but it's the memories it made in the minds of terrified gamers that earned its spot on the top 100. The original Resident Evil was the, was the first game that made me and my, my best friend keep, our, keep the lights on overnight. Coming up on the top 100 video games of all time. If I can't knock you out and hurt you, then I don't want to play. The gloves come off and the punches start to fly. It's like playing with two Patrick Swayze's for Roadhouse. As we jump closer to the number one spot in the countdown. Pop quiz, who is the best boss ever to kill in the entire history of video games? Mecha Hitler. Go. Will your favorite survive the cut? Kratos must be a real bummer at parties. Or will their number be up? Finish him. When the top 100 video games of all time continues. Here we go again! That gotta be like one of the best video games like ever. <laughs>